In our previous lesson, you learned how easy it is to use two of the commonly used built-in ADTs in .NET when working with collection of objects. In this lesson, we are going to structure and implement our custom ADT that will support some of the basic operations similar to our list. This includes add, insert, remove add, search, and sort. Now, just a reminder, for you to have a good grasp of this topic, basic knowledge of object-oriented programming like what a class and object is, how to structure a member of the class like fields, properties, and methods is highly recommended. Although I'm going to inject a very light discussion of some of the OOP concepts as we build our custom ADT, but here are some quick links if you want to do some readings first. For this demonstration, I'm going to keep it simple. Let's build our custom ADT, but for now, I will limit it to storing items of type integer only. So let's begin. I'll start by creating another class to structure our custom ADT, and I'm going to name it as integer list. I'm going to do a split view of my code here so you can see both codes simultaneously. On the left side is our main application, and on the right side is our custom ADT implementation, represented by integer list class. First, let us structure our integer list ADT based from our required operations as I mentioned earlier. I'll structure the following public methods, add, insert, remove add, sort, and search. Public means that these methods will be accessible to the calling program, in this case our main application, and void means when these methods are called and executed, there will be no return value to the calling program. However, in our search method, I'll use int instead of void, which means once this search method gets executed, it will return an integer value representing the index of the item if found. For the meantime, I'll place here return negative 1. So basically, this is the initial structure of our custom ADT, and on the perspective of the user from our main application, all the user needs to do is to create an object of this integer list ADT and start calling the desired operations like add or insert and so on. But on the side of the implementer, we have to understand first how the user of this ADT wants to use these operations. Like in this add method, for example, as a user, what I want when I call this method is just to pass in an item and in effect, that item is added to the list. So it means, as an implementer, I need to place an integer parameter here so that it accepts the value passed by the caller of this method. Similarly, in my insert method, if the user will pass two arguments, the index and the item to be inserted, I need to modify this method definition to receive two parameters as well, to accept both the index and the item to be inserted. For the remove at method, an index parameter is required so that the item in that index is deleted as a result. For the sort method, we don't need any parameter for this. And lastly, for the search method, we need to pass the value of the item to be searched, and this argument should be accepted here as well. So when we run it, of course, nothing will show up because we haven't done any implementation yet. No items were added, inserted, removed, or sorted. So to implement this custom ADT, we need to decide what underlying data structure we are going to use. Typically, it can be implemented using an array or a linked list, but I haven't discussed the linked list data structure yet, and you'll learn it in the next few videos. Thus, we will implement this using array data structure. So I'll declare an array of integer and mark it as private, meaning this class member is not accessible to the calling program. It will only be available privately to the members of this class. Notice that I did not initialize its size yet because I'm going to do this inside the constructor of this class, which means this array of size 5 gets created only when this integer list class is created. And basically, that's the main purpose of the constructor of a class, a place where you initialize everything in order to make your object ready and usable upon creation or instantiation. In our integer list class, Every time an instance of it is created, an integer array of size 5 is also created internally. Now, let's provide the implementation for our add method. And to do this, I need another private field here, an integer index. This variable will keep track of the current position of our topmost item as we add, insert, or remove item from this array. Similarly, 
I'll initialize it to negative 1 once this class gets created. This denotes that this array is empty at the start. And when we call this add method, I'll increment this index variable so the first item is assigned to index 0, a second call to this method assigns the second item to index 1, a third call assigns the third item to index 2, and so on. But if you're thinking ahead, you might ask, what happens if I call this add method more than 5 times, which is bigger than the capacity we declared for our private array? Well, definitely, this application will crash, and we don't want this thing to happen with our ADT. So for now, let's just put a condition here that will only allow adding of items to our array for as long as the index is less than the array's current size. Otherwise, let's reset the previous value of this index by subtracting it with 1. I'll discuss how to make a static array to behave like dynamic array in the next video. So based from our implemented logic, this add method should work. But how do we verify if this array really has the values passed by the calling program? For that, I'm going to add another public method here, and I'll call it getArray. This method will return all the elements of our private array, and in our calling program, I'm going to use the for each loop and read all the items returned by this getArray method. Now, let's check the result. And as you can see, 5, 14, 10 were successfully added and displayed. But unfortunately, we also see these two default zeros, which we are not supposed to see since we only added three items on the list. To solve this problem, I'll create a local array of integer I'll call temp array and set its size equal to the number of items added. And in this case, we managed to keep track of it using this index field and I'll add one for its size because if we have elements at index 0, 1, 2, the array size should be 3. And then, using the for loop, I'll copy all elements from my private field array to this local temp array. I'll start from index 0, but only up to the location pointed by this index variable, which is the less than temp array that length, and not the private array that length. Finally, what I'll be returning is the reference to this temp array. Now, let's check the output. And it works great. Extra zeros are no longer returned. Next, let's implement the insert method. The algorithm when inserting item to an array is this. If we have an array of size 5 and if the current array only consists of 3 items at index 0, 1, and 2, for example, we are only allowed to insert at either index 0, 1, or 2. If we insert an item at index 1, the logic is to first shift the item at index 2 to 3 and index 1 to 2 before performing the actual assignment of the value to index 1. So, to implement this, I need to put a condition first to check if the target index for the item to be inserted is within the valid range, meaning non-negative and must not exceed the private field index defined in this class. The this keyword here distinguishes the ambiguity brought by these two variables having the same name of index. One is the local and the other one is the private field. The this keyword is used to denote class member's field, property, or method of the current object and then to shift the element to the right starting from the topmost item down to the item pointed by the target index for insertion, I'll type array index i plus 1, which points to the next location to the right, equals to, and assign the item from the current location. This will be repeatedly performed until the target index is reached. Then, after performing the shifting process outside this loop, I'll assign the actual item to the location pointed by this target index. And finally, I'll increment the private field index to update its position to the topmost element of my array. Now, let's verify the output. And we were able to successfully insert item 88 at index 1. Let's try one more time. I'll insert 88 at index 0, and it works perfectly. For our final checking, Let's try inserting it at index 4, in which case it must not succeed since it violates our rule of insert. As you can see, it did not push through with the insert. But the problem is that there's no indication to the main application that the current insert operation did not commit. As a good programming practice, if you care enough to the user of your ADT, whether it is you or another programmer in your team, 
you should always provide a means for your user to be notified if any error occurred. I'll add an else part here and throw a very simple exception saying index out of range. In effect, if violation occurred, this will break the calling program and it's up to the calling program to handle it properly. Let's check the output. And as we expected, the program breaks. And our exception message shows index out of range. But of course, for a valid insert, this exception will not appear. So for now, I'll end this part one of this video lecture and let you absorb what you just learned. I encourage you to try implementing on your own the remove at, sort, and search method before checking my implementation. For our next lesson, I'll continue the implementation of these remaining methods and apply the concept of dynamic arrays so that the users of our custom ADT don't have to worry of exceeding the defined capacity of our array. And again, thanks for watching. And if you like this video, please click the like and subscribe button. Also, links to previous videos in this playlist are provided below.